All right, everybody. I man, Sinclair. I am so glad and so excited to talk for you. So Sinclair and I have become fast friends. I think we're we're sisters from another mother. Just like we're two peas in a pod, and I consider her one of my favorite friends in the entire world. And so I'm so excited to have her on the podcast today. So Sinclair Canaley, yay! You're here with us. So I want to to share your story because I think it's so important for people to know where people come from and, and why they're here. Will you share your story? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on Betty. You know, I was looking forward to this too. And I feel the same way about you. Um, so my story is not pretty. I'll tell you that I'm not somebody that came to physical health because I thought it was super fun to obsess about it was something I always took, you know, I almost said took advantage of, and that's probably true too, but I took for granted, like most Americans do, and like health is just supposed to be there. I shouldn't have to think about this, right? But really, when you look back, like the, the writing was on the wall, like by the time I crashed and ended up in the hospital, um, I actually had been on the road to that for decades and I just wasn't listening to the signs. And honestly, even if I had been, I wouldn't have known what to do with them. You know, I was a very sensitive kid, digestive wise, sensitive to chemicals and new clothes and, you know, stuff like that. And, um, got a lot of like strep throat along the way, a lot of ear infections, a lot of antibiotics. And, um, so the, the writing on the wall was definitely there. Like the microbiome, something's not right with this one. <laughs> oh, I know let's, you know, mess with it some more. <laughs> right. And, um, I did end up, you know, really struggling with an eating disorder and going through programs for that as a teen. And, um, a lot of that honestly was like undiagnosed pans and pandas for me looking back. And so by the time I ended up in my twenties, you know, early twenties in the hospital, totally collapsed. They could not figure out what was wrong with me. Um, it had been a long time coming, you know, and I, we called it exhaustion. I gave up after a few days cause I didn't have health insurance. So I, you know, just dragged myself home and got into bed and did not get out for months. And, you know, I would keep trying and going to different specialists and I would get various diagnoses like, well, your labs look fine. So it's probably all in your head. So here's some uppers, here's some downers. Oh, you can't sleep anymore. Cause what we gave you, oh, here's something for that. And they would just layer and layer until I really felt less and less like myself. I thought I was going insane. I thought it really was all in my head. And I was way more aware of the anxiety and the depression than the pain. Cause I have such a high pain tolerance and um, that it took me a long time to figure out that, yes, I do have fibromyalgia. Yes. You know, I had the Hashimoto's and the Lyme disease and all that stuff, but really even getting those diagnoses, it's like, okay, so there's, it's like a false win, right? Okay. Now I have a label to describe my pain. Now I have an excuse to share with people who have all been wondering what's wrong with you. Why are you so hard to deal with? Why can't I count on you? You seem fine one day. And then, you know, a few weeks later you're, you disappear. Um, and it's still there for so many of us, it's, it actually ends up being a dead end. Right. And thank God my partner, Michael was just like refusing to give up. He was on his own health journey, had totally different symptoms than I did. Um, but he figured it out. He went to a European toxicology conference and called me from there and said, I know what's wrong with both of us. And he turned out to be right. You know, it was mold toxicity. It was heavy metals. Um, when we measured our house for EMFs, we were sleeping in seven volts, which anything over one volt is considered catastrophic by building biologists. So we just had all these pressures and stressors on our bodies that were um, adding up that were invisible you know, but are considered totally normal in terms of exposure. And because he and I both started out in mental health and became too sick to run our practices, this was a real wake up call for us. Like, wait a minute, what if the anxiety and the depression and the inflammation and the insomnia, all these things that we're used to chalking up to mental and emotional issues and wanting people to go that route to heal them. What if there's a physical component as well? And what if it dovetails and is exactly the same as what's happening with this explosion of chronic illness in our country that doctors do not have good answers for, you know? So it, it was a really interesting journey and I'm not going to say it was fun, but it was so rewarding to get to the other side of it and, and be so inspired to share it with everybody. And now we've helped thousands and thousands of people to take back their own health. So worth it in the end. <laughs> 
Well, and I think you, you bring up a very good point. So we either in the allopathic sort of model, which is really designed for communicable diseases and surgical interventions from warfare. I mean, that's where all of that stuff was really designed from. But when they don't have an answer because it doesn't fit into a neatly held label, again, here's your box. Well, thank you for my box and my label, but it, that doesn't then direct what happens next. It doesn't tell me how I got here. It doesn't often even lead to how to fix it from here other than maybe how to cover up the label. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. It, it's like, is it acute? Oh, good. Uh oh, it's chronic. Never mind. We don't know what to do with you. <laughs> right. But as soon as it's that, then it's like, oh, okay. Okay. So you've been, you've been coming here a long time and, and you keep coming with all these new symptoms. Oh, now we think it's in your head, right? Because, because again, it, so it's, it's, it's this, it's in your head if we don't know what it is physically. And if it's physical and we can't get the answer, it's in your head. But then if it's in your head and then you start falling apart, it's got to be physical. We need to come up with a new label, you know? Yeah. And, and this is so interesting too, because we're like using these outdated antiquated labs to assess these things in the allopathic world. And those lab values, nobody's asking the question. The patients don't know to ask, well, how are those lab parameters established? And sometimes, you know, like when it comes to like thyroid values, a lot of those were established with um, Navy SEAL guys, little like young kids, like 21, 22 year old males back in the sixties. And they haven't been updated since, or conversely, we just shifted what's considered normal for certain basic liver values, because everybody's so sick now that it's considered common and normal. And those two are not the same thing. <laughs> common does not mean normal. <laughs> and we're not asking why, and patients don't know you know, people don't know to ask these questions. Well, how, how do we know that that's a normal range? And is that a normal range for me? You know, exactly. Well, and those are really designed like your basic, you know, comprehensive metabolic panels and complete blood counts. Those reference ranges are really looking for direct pathology. Yes. Not, Thank not you for dis- saying that. Not dysfunction. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but if your kidney markers and liver markers come back, like off the chart, we've got some serious, like, organ, organ problems, if not somewhat failure or dysfunction that is significant, but that doesn't necessarily say that they're running at optimal. And it's, and it's just a travesty that our standard of care is designed to basically only pick up the really diseased outliers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's what we see, right? We see for so many people that you're spending at least 10 years struggling with not feeling well, not feeling like yourself before you finally get a label before you finally get sick enough to qualify for a label. And then what, you know, what are are the treatment options really? It is like, do the clouds part and suddenly you get fast tracked back to health? No, nothing could be further from the truth. So we don't have a great, and in the meantime, you know, our ill health span has doubled in the last 10 years. So ill health span refers to um, how long do you feel not well or unwell? at the end of your life. And it used to be 10 years, the last 10 years of our lives on average for Americans. Anyway, we did not feel well. And just in the last decade that has doubled to the last 20 years of your life. You do not feel well that you are, your health is compromised. That's not okay. We're headed in the wrong direction. And people think, cause we live in a developed country, um, whether in the U S or Europe or Australia or New Zealand or any of those, um, that we don't have to think about this stuff, that just progress is inevitable. And actually, when you look at toxic exposures and how fast that they're ramping up, the opposite is the case. Our life expectancy is dropping. Our ill health span is, is growing exponentially. And the data is all there for those who look for it, but it takes 40 years for new data to, read, to reach mainstream consciousness. And we don't have that kind of time. No, no. I, th- I think especially um, those that are in probably our age group are blissfully, and I'm using air quotes around that, blissfully unaware of what the prognosis looks like for those of us when we enter into, I hate to dare to say it, but our senior years is we're going to have a lot of disability and discomfort. Mm. You're going to be sick, but not dead, right? (laughs) Which I like to call as a franchise player because that really makes the medical establishment a lot of money right? You need constant surveillance. You need lots of medications and you're going to need procedures and time in the hospital, but you don't actually expire, right? So the entire medical system is really built on this financial model of ill, not dead, right? Yes. Yes. They want 
customer is not success stories. It's a very different orientation when you look at the decisions being made about treatments. And it doesn't mean that your doctor isn't a wonderful person. But when you look at like structure determines behavior, what are the options available to allopathic practitioners structurally? They do not answer the needs of today. Like, I'll just give you a quick example. Um, there's a German uh, study that was done in 2008 that um, revealed that, and this is across 1200 subjects, equally American and European, that we average 10 toxins per cell, which is an enormous body burden. And then by, by toxin, I don't mean your normal metabolic waste. I mean, an outside environmental toxicant that is, um, a foreign material that your, that your body struggles to, to deal with 10 toxins per cell. 10 years later, the same study was repeated 1200 subjects in 2018. And we had increased to 500 toxins per cell. So we 50 X our environmental toxicant burden in 10 years. And we wonder why natural health methods that used to be, you know, we used to get quick wins from, um, you know, they're just not working as well. They're not as powerful. We have practitioners joining our practice right now that are specifically coming to learn our model because they know they're experts in their field, but what they're doing is not enough anymore. That's crazy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it begs the question, at what point do we, do we have a new paradigm? Because I know for you guys and how you really look at people, you have these different areas of root cause that you really, you're like, okay, this is where we have to go, right? And I think it's dramatically different than what you're going to hear in a traditional world and maybe even in, in a functional medicine, alternative, complementary, whatever you want to call it. You know, when you use the words functional medicine, that often can be like ice cream, right? We've got a million different flavors, <laughs> depends on the flavor people practice, but there's a, you know, there's an ordering of things and a way to look at it. But I think you've uncovered some root cause um, activity that really needs to be addressed. Would you want to share that with everybody? Yeah, I'm happy to. And, you know, one of the many reasons why I love you is because you're not afraid to talk about where we're falling short as a community and where we need to go next. And I think you're right. You know, many people hold up functional medicine as the answer, but when you think about allopathic medicine, you're suppressing a symptom and you're trying to, um, say that, that, you know, you're trying to override the body's wisdom essentially for acute trauma, you know, stabilization, not great for chronic, right? But fun functional medicine is not that much different when you're looking at it. It's still trying to override the body's wisdom in many ways and trying to plug holes. Oh, your lab values are low for these 17 things. We'll just supplement these 17 things instead of asking, well, why, why can't your body absorb that on its own or make that on its own? And what's the quickest route to making it totally independent again? Let's find that you know, and that's a much more generative approach. And that is our approach. We call it, you know, generative, he generative healing, basically, so that you're not overriding and you're not substituting, you are removing interference. So the body can do what it already knows how to do. And that's where the root causes come in. So we think about things like, well, first of all, we have to understand and accept and really embrace the, the truth that we are not separate from our environments. We're basically air plants guys, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> We are absorbing the light, the air, the water around us. And of course our food, all of it, you know, when you sit down on the couch, you're breathing in all of the toxins that whoosh out of the styrofoam and all of the, you know, flame retardants. And it's going in through your nasal passages, you know, into your throat, into your lungs, and also through your skin. Like you are not separate from your environment. So your environment matters a lot. And that's like the first layer of consciousness really. And then comes the biochemical where, you know, at the cellular level, you know, we have it, we call the, you know, hormone, the endocrine system, the slow nervous system, because we're sending chemicals and messengers at this slow rate to regulate the body and all of its processes, um, which is awesome. Um, but it's only one layer, right? And then you have the bioelectrical. So you have the nervous system, which has a cascade effect down to the lower levels, because it's so good at regulating certain things, but it can also get easily overwhelmed by these environmental triggers and stressors. And then you have all those more subtle layers like emotions, you know, beliefs, um, thought patterns, things that you're carrying for your family. You and I both do family constellation work. So, you know, I got to put that in there because we really are not existing by ourselves. 
we are always within a web of connectivity, right? Our fields extend far beyond our bodies and we are really connected to people beyond what we can see because we're, we're pack animals, you know, we're meant to be together. Otherwise we'd all be, you know, living on a mountaintop raising goats by ourselves, which sounds great on most days, to be honest, <laughs> but here we are reaching out for more connection with each other. <laughs> so anyway, when we look at the root causes, we want to look at them it, impacting each of these layers because a poison is not just a poison. It matters like, yeah, okay. So it's not supposed to be in your body. Who cares? Well, it only matters if it affects who you are at a physical, mental, and emotional level. Like sometimes depending on the audience, I will get up as a keynote speaker somewhere, especially if it's for like, um, people struggling with weight. And it's a whole audience of people that feel like their body or chronically ill people feel like their bodies have failed them. And I will start my talk by saying, hi, my name is Sinclair Keneally and I don't give a shit about health I, because I don't, I don't care about this external image that we have held up like the runner who's a size zero and does yoga seven times a week and never gets anything wrong and only eats, you know, a noodle a day and lives on zucchini juice. Like that's not what I care about. I care. Do you feel like who you really are? Do you feel at home in your body? Do you feel powerful and strong in your body? Are you able to connect with life the way you really need to, to express your being and your purpose for being alive? That's all I care about. And so that's how these root causes really got our attention because they're so good at disrupting that on every level of our being. So the first one that we talk about is heavy metals. And I have to call this out and I know you're down for this. So I'm just going to do it Go for it. I'm down. <laughs> yeah, I'm down with it. Totally. You know? <laughs> so we're in the middle of a mental health movement right now, which is amazing and wonderful. And within that we have gotten very good at naming and labeling things almost as if to distance them ourselves from them. Mm -hmm. We almost talk about like my anxiety, my anxiety is if it's my pet you know, on social media, you see all these Instagram posts, my anxiety won't let me blah, blah, blah. My anxiety, this, my anxiety wants that. It is as if we are divorcing ourselves from a sensation in our being. That is very typical of heavy metals exposure. So is depression. So is irritability. So is mood swings. So does ADHD. So is dementia. Like we have to talk about the mental health and emotional health aspects of these environmental toxicant root causes, because they were not separate from our bodies, you know? So yes, heavy metals will cause, you know, all sorts of cancers and, you know, digestive disorders, you know, oftentimes people's, you know, mercury amalgam fillings that they got as kids or teenagers, that is your on-ramp to digestive chronic illness. And yep. nobody bothered to tell you that because it's still legal. <laughs> um, we can get into that if you want. But the heavy metals are absolutely one of the top root causes for us not being able to heal ourselves. And we are particularly um, susceptible to them these days because we're exposed to another root cause, which is industrial chemicals. Like, for example, herbicides that strip our food's ability to retain minerals. Therefore the food that we're eating is empty. Therefore we are deficient in minerals that we should be having just from normal meals. You know, like how come grandma got away with eating like, you know, red meat and not eating her veggies and smoking a pack a day. And she loved her whiskey. Like how come, how come she got away with that? And, and you have to eat organic and you're allergic to 17 million things. Right. Exactly. Because she got to have a microbiome that was super healthy and non-disrupted for a long time. And she also had enough minerals, natural minerals on board that when she got exposed to heavy metals, it wasn't as devastating. All these things fit together, right? Yeah. So heavy metals and industrial chemicals, those are two of them. And stop me whenever you want to, because I know you know a lot about this stuff too. Well, and I think I, I do want to say something, because I don't think people realize that the intelligence of a cell a lot of it is happening at that membrane. So when I don't have adequate minerals and I have heavy metals in there intervening, I can't move stuff in and out of the cell, but I can't also emit 
neurotransmitters and get things to work together. Synapses don't meet. Like there are electrical signals that are no longer working and the body is electric. And it, mm-hmm. and it requires adequate minerals and a variety of them in the right places at the right time. And all of that stuff disrupted, you know? That's so beautifully said. And when you also look at like the supply chain for oils, for example, that cell membrane is supposed to be made of healthy fats. And if it's made of rancid fats instead, you cannot absorb the nutrients that are trying to arrive at the cell and you cannot excrete waste or toxins from the cell in the same way. So you're inflamed all the time. So these things have cumulative effects. One plus one, when it comes to toxins, never equals two. It equals 11, sometimes 111. So it's really important to understand this. And, you know, another one that really we have to separate out on its own because it's so prevalent now is mold. Yeah. It really is a root cause for disrupting the health because it's so good as a colonizing fungus that coming in and suppressing the immune system and slowing down the liver and congesting your bile so that you cannot excrete toxins at the same rate that you used to. You cannot fight off pathogens at the same rate that you used to. Like, why do I have H. pylori? Why do I have parasites? Why do I this? Why do I have candida? Well, Candida is not, your body's not stupid. You didn't just get candida accidentally and trying to kill it the way the functional medicine wants to can create a lot of problems because candida will be in there to mop up mercury for you. Candida will be there to mop up the radiation in your water. If you live in Texas or some of the radiation belts, candida will be there as, you know, a little buddy to mold. Oh, mold's there. This is a perfect environment for me. Great. I'll come in and set up shop too. So we have to unpack these things in the right order. And this is why I'm so frustrated with functional medicine because they know about these things, but American functional medicine is so far behind in the sense that they just want to hunt and kill whatever they see show up on the labs. And they're using stuff that we know no longer works. Like, you know, I inherit people all the time from functional medicine, you know, well-regarded practitioners because they did this in the wrong order or, you know, oh, you know, I was, I, this mercury showed up on my tests. So, you know, we did all this expensive IV chelation and then I got really sick. It's like, yeah, "Yeah," because you don't want to do that. First of all, chelation doesn't work. It's so hard on the body. Yeah. And second, you don't have the mineral composition on board for your body to safely let go of and excrete those heavy metals. This has to be done in the right order. So yes, you want to know about these root causes to empower yourself to talk to your practitioner and ask questions, Mm -hmm. but you also need to choose a practitioner that understands the order these things need to be addressed in. No, I agree. I see it all the time. Like the first thing out of the gate, they go, Ooh, let's heavy metal chelate. And I'm like, Whoa, that should be like down the road, like way, way down. Red flag. (laughs) Yeah. Red flag. Cause they, yeah, they feel very, very sick and they're falling apart. And then they're, and then they get told, Oh, that's a Herxheimer's response. It'll just get better. You just have to go through and wade through the the, the terribleness of it. And I'm like, if, if we do it in the right order, I'm not saying that there won't be disruption, but you shouldn't feel dramatically worse than you do right now. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself. Like, oh, herxing means it's working. No, babe. Herxing means that we're doing it out of order or that you do not have the, ele- the supporting elements in place to empower the body to do what it knows how to do. You're never going to outsmart the body. You have to get great at asking questions of the body. What would you like next? Right. That's, that's what we need to become experts at as practitioners. And also as the people who, you know, if you are ill or you're not feeling at your best, you got to become your own advocate. You are the CEO of your own health. It's not your fault that you don't feel well, but it is your job to fix it. And the day you take that into every cell of your being is the day you're set free. Yeah. You have to really be your own advocate and, and be, and be willing to stand up and go, I don't think this works for me, or this isn't right for me, or, you know, is there another way? Yeah, exactly. So the last root cause that I will touch on is, um, unless we have time for a couple more, <laughs> we have time for a couple more. Okay. Um, the, well, the next one I want to do is EMFs because it answers the question, well, why could, grandma and grandpa just like cruise through life, eating mold on a regular basis or live in a moldy cabin 
And yeah, they kind of dealt with it and kind of cleaned it up, but it was like mold was no big deal. Right. And why is it such a big deal now? Well, one of the biggest things that have changed about our environment in the last 20 years is that our, our use of radiation has exploded. And when you in, bring something into your home, like a mini cell phone tower, we all know that, you know, or we used to know, at least in, in California and where all the hippies live, you didn't want your kid, you know, going to a school next to a cell phone tower. It wasn't ideal, or you didn't want to live right next to one. And now we've normalized this so much and we've brought many cell phone towers in the form of Wi-Fi routers into our homes and they're on 24 seven, whether you use them or not. And they are expressing radiation at you that is in the same range as a microwave oven. It's in the same frequency range. And we wouldn't put a baby or a kitten or a bouquet of flowers, anything that we want to maintain the preciousness of the life form in a microwave and expect it to feel great afterwards. Why are we doing it to ourselves? Especially because mold takes less than 24 hours to colonize in the body. And over half of the buildings in the U S have been water damaged and it takes less than 24 hours for water damage to turn into mold. And you don't have to see it. You don't have to smell it. Mold loves to hide behind paint in deep in the drywall. Drywall is like one of its favorite foods to snack on. And then it can release spores effortlessly through that porous material and into your life and it can colonize in your body. No problem. And mold loves to spread out and it does not like competition. So it will start making sure that your body is not a welcome environment for the good bugs that you rely on for your basic metabolic processes, as in your ability to self heal and maintain vitality. And Mold also wants to use those same range of frequency bands to talk to itself because it's a colony, right? And when it is in the presence of Wi-Fi, it thinks it's under attack because it cannot communicate as effectively and it starts dumping extra poison. That's what mycotoxins are. There's mold, the colonizer, and then the poison that they dump that's so hard for your body to deal with is mycotoxins. And mold will dump up to 600 times the amount of mycotoxin poison in the presence of EMFs. That's why mold is a big deal now. There are other reasons, but that is like the primary difference between now and 20 years ago. Like why are, why are kids today so freaking sensitive? Everything that we've already listed, we don't have to go looking further. We can, but we don't have to, cause we have plenty to work on, you know? Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's, um, if you think about it, even, even when they first started putting in electrical towers way back when, right, there's, there's documented cases in the literature of like farm animals expiring because they were underneath an electrical tower, mm -hmm. right? But we're talking about electromagnetic radiation that's at a much greater rate coming off your phone and your Wi-Fi, your smart meters, your, you know, your 5G, all of that. There's just an extraordinary explosion of this stuff that's become just normalized, right? Self-driving cars. <laughs> so we're going to get bathed in it. You know? You're making such a great point because um, we call them smart devices, but the only one, uh, the only person that they're smart for is the corporation that smells, that sells them. They're not smart for you. They're stupid for you. They're stupid for your body. Your body hates them. Um, and that little bit of convenience that you get because you asked Alexa to turn on the lights instead of you doing it costs you the energy you would naturally have to where that you wouldn't need that convenience. And this is not a fair trade. It's not, you know, and what people don't realize is that your cell phone is not just something or your Alexa, you know, little robot <laughs> or your smart fridge. These are not just able to receive signals. They are always transmitting. Mm -hmm. And you are not in control of when those transmit, when that transmission happens and how high it peaks, how disruptive to the body it is. And these are not like edgy things to say. There's over 14,000 studies done on the damage of EMFs. These corporations are well aware of what they're doing and they have deliberately chosen studies to essentially um, silence anybody that would talk about this, that where they study like the effects of EMFs for less than 10 seconds at a time on your cardio 
uh, output and EKGs than like your, the tissue damage in your heart. Like for 10 seconds, does this signal damage you? No. Okay. Well, here you go. Government, we've proven that this is safe. Thanks for pushing through 5G and the next thing. And this isn't enough because that's not actually how we're using it. And what they're saying is like, well, we're going to average everything out in this algorithm and whatever the average is for this device or this signal bandwidth for this one exposure, um, as long as that average isn't too damaging for the body, we'll probably be okay. But that's not how the body thinks. The body thinks about every time there's a peak exposure, it thinks about long-term cumulative effect and peak exposures. And it's not one device. You know, the average several years ago was 10 smart devices per home. And I don't believe that to be true. Everybody I talked to is over 20 now. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's really interesting. And it's telling too, because people are waking up to this all the time. Like the former Microsoft CEO of Canada, mm -hmm. um, he could no longer look away from the EMF issue because of um, personal relationships in his life that were suffering from EMF exposure. And he left Microsoft to start a nonprofit that pulls Wi-Fi out of schools instead of putting it in. Wow. That's pretty telling, right? Microsoft's own campuses are hardwired. They don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> they run on fiber optic cable. That's interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. they want their employees to be at peak performance. Right, right. So if it's wired, at least you're going to reduce that overall exposure significantly. Yeah. They want you to be able to think well and do your work and last. Great. I want that for me too. I want that in my home. I want that for everybody listening. <laughs> right. Well, and here's another even more, even nefarious thing. All these smart devices have a high opportunity for hacking. They it's don't the carry... Truth. Yeah, they don't carry the same... I used to be in Texas years, decades ago now at this point, but they don't carry the same security updates and things like your laptop and your computer and everything else will have. So they are ripe for opportunity for, for hacking. And people go, well, I don't care if my refrigerator gets hacked. I'm like, yeah, but your refrigerator is talking to your Alexa, which is talking to your laptop, which is talking to everything else in your house. <laughs> like, like Exactly. So even if you're not worried about the electronics in your, of your body and the EMS and everything else, there could be hacking your refrigerator and God knows what they might be getting <laughs> at some point, right? Like it's, it's here's all my stuff. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just to tie that back into the body, like it's, it's so easy for us to forget that, um, our body is our home and it knows exactly what to do to take care of itself. It's just in an environment where that is getting slowed down and disrupt, disrupted constantly. Like even just EMFs, even if you just shut off all, your, all of your EMF exposure while you were sleeping. So that you had none of that stress on your body, your brain could relax and it could drain much more effectively with the glymphatic system. Your body would be able to build your detox, your complex detox enzyme chains that take six hours to build those suckers to help flush out your normal metabolic waste while you sleep, let alone the environmental toxicants you've been exposed to during the day. You know, your tissue would regenerate faster. You would sleep more deeply because trying to sleep in the presence of EMFs is like asking your brain to sleep with the fluorescence on. It's not a subtle exposure. Your brain's very aware of what's happening. You know, we just, we need to give our bodies a break. And I don't, I'm not saying you have to move to the woods and live on leaves in the dark. You can, if you want, and you might want to after this podcast, but <laughs> I'm not telling you to, I'm, I'm saying, let's be smart. Let's take control of our own lives. Let's look at how to reduce things. Do you really need your Wi-Fi enabled printer on constantly. How often do you really use your printer? Unplug that damn thing. It's not enough to power these off because um, if any device manufacturer does a system update, they can turn the Wi-Fi on for any device that is plugged in. Like your smart TV in your bedroom is not off. It's still emitting if the power is off. You have to actually remove power from the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, they're set to like auto updates. So they're just boop, pick up stuff and broadcast and zap you constantly. People think about it. Like it's like a, you know, a one-to-one, -one, like, oh, I send a signal and I receive it. And then everything goes quiet. This is not like Morse code. This is like you know, constant, constant eruption. Yeah. It's more so, like sonar. Boop, <laughs> boop, 
you know, constant beeping and constant, you know, sending out emissions to figure out what's in front and behind. Yeah. And depending on the signal source, your body's thinking about it more like a foghorn, like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, it's very true. Now I know you, you go a little deeper too, into kind of the stress emotions, the, the other stuff that I think often gets overlooked too. And sort of the functional medicine model, unless, unless somebody's deeply steeped in sort of the mental emotional side, it's kind of like, okay, that's sort of over there. We're going to work with the body chemistry and sort of play with that world. So talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, I'm happy to. So, um, I think this is really important for people to understand when they're interviewing a practitioner or they're considering, you know, the next step in their health is that a lot of people know to set, not give lip service now to, oh yeah, mind, body, spirit, mind, body, spirit. Yeah. We walk, we work, we work on mind, body, spirit. That's what we do. We have these words in our brochures and on, my, on our website. That's great <laughs> because you are one being with multiple layers of consciousness operating and informing each other constantly, right? But you want to choose practitioners that deeply understand how to access those layers of consciousness and support them through the healing process. I have yet to meet a client or student that has been affected by these environmental root causes that we just named that did not also have layers of nervous system toxicity and dysfunction. So at the bioelectrical level, we're talking about trauma, big T and little T trauma and, you know, repetitive stress, like residual stress patterns that you do not know how to shake without some extra support. And there's an additional layer even beyond that, that emotional constriction. And so I would, because our bodies remember are not just, um, they are our subconscious. They're not just housing our subconscious. They are the subconscious. And it's where you are manufacturing the chemical expression of your emotions and feeling them and storing them, right? So we have to understand, and you can look to many models for this traditional Chinese medicine, for example, understood this intimately several thousand years ago. They knew exactly where emotions were getting stored, organ by organ, meridian by meridian liver for anger, you know, resentment for gallbladder, lungs for grief, kidneys for fear. These, these are not accidents. We have these emotional signatures and how they relate to the body is not only fascinating, but it's deeply freeing to stop turning away from that, face it head on and ask the body, how would you like to be supported in releasing these things? You are not on your own. I'm here for you. It's safe to access these now. And I'm not talking about talk therapy. Talk therapy is fine if you want to do that. Michael, my partner in all things, used to be a talk therapist, <laughs> but he will be the first one to tell you about the significant limitations of those models. And we were oriented ever more, you know, as time goes on towards, you know, rapid change. We've now been in rapid change work for decades. So we use things like um, symbolic modeling is phenomenal for, you know, acknowledging the metaphors that you're, so your subconscious speaks to you in metaphors and that's how things bubble up to the conscious surface, so to speak, to use a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We, for use, we use actually an average of six metaphors per minute in our speech because we're trying to express our internal experience in a way that in a shorthand, it's like telling the world, Hey, everybody, this is what it's like on the inside over here. And if you know how to work with your metaphors, not only do you get, finally get the respect that your system needs in order to feel safe and to heal, you know, because you're not trying to contort into like the Tony Robbins breakthrough model for Tony, everything's a breakthrough. Everything's a wall and you smash through it. And it's so great. And you jump up and down and you have a superhero pose. Awesome. Tony has walls. Cool. You might not, you know, you might be in a pit that you can't climb out of, or you might feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you might buckle under the weight of that you know, or you might feel so porous because you don't have enough life force to maintain your own boundaries that you are, you are a sponge for everybody's emotions around you. And now those different metaphors will resonate very strongly for different people. And other people will be like, nah, that's not me. And your, your subconscious, your body is telling you, this is how I'm organized. And the more we acknowledge that the faster you get to heal, because it, my metaphor for you will not work. But if I understand how to listen to your metaphors and all I do 
is hold the space for you, hold the space haha, <laughs> to, for you to hold your attention and go into that psychoactive space where you're actually just listening to your metaphors. You, your body will update your metaphors itself. Your body knows the solution. Your subconscious knows exactly how it would prefer to be organized for a maximum state of healing and flow, but it needs help because it's stuck in the stress pattern. So these are some of the ways that we address very gently and respectfully, and also rapidly these root causes at the emotional and the neurological level, right? And we also need to make room for one of the last root causes, which is that we, we are all part of a system, right? And I know you believe in this really strongly too, because we have all felt this. We all have a lineage. We all come from somewhere. We all belong somewhere. And whatever happened along the way is going to affect your health big time. And you carry in you, you know, the lineage and the, the patterns that from before, right? Bert, Bert Hellinger's work is, is amazing. He's the father of what we call family constellation work today. And, um, it's a really fascinating body of work and it's a really rapid way for you to discover what are you carrying that's not yours? How can you give it back so that you can be all of who you really are and your family members, your loved ones, those that came before you can finally be whole as well. Right. Everybody right. needs to be in their right place in the lineage. That's how you restore the state of flow the flow of love. And we stop trying to be more to each other than we can be. We just be ourselves. And that's when you really have room to be you. Right. I think, I think a lot of people, particularly, I would say in a Western sort of mindset, generally feel like I have my stuff, right? These are my cells. These are my experiences. This is my big T, little T trauma, not trauma, or for those that are type A, my stress, right? So, so we have that experience, but we think that everybody else's shit is their shit, right? Like that's your stuff. Like my parents' stuff, my grandparents' stuff, my great grandparents' stuff, you know, my people, when they were in a caveman, partially Neanderthal or whatever they had going on was not mine, but all of those little bits and pieces in DNA all traveled through and you still have some of it and we're carrying it like a backpack. That's a really beautiful way to say it. Yeah, it's exactly like a backpack and that can be really heavy and overstuffed. And it, it also under the right circumstances can become very safe for you to suddenly discover what's in there and gently hand it to the appropriate places so that it's not yours. Like for example, I'll just give a couple quick, quick examples for reference. So this isn't abstract. Um, you know, when, when I was little, my dad was an amazing dad and he was, he was very patient, but he was also really sad. He was extremely depressed. And he was often suicidal and, um, he was doing so much better than his dad had had before him, like in terms of lineage, oh my God, you know, leaps and leaps and bounds. But I was really scared for him often because I could tell from a very young age that he was caring so much. And I tried to carry some of his sadness for him because I was afraid that I would lose him if I didn't. Now, those are my words as an adult going back and making sense of it with language. And the, the truth is, you know, much more magical and mysterious than that. But the, the act of handing his sadness back to him, not in a joint therapy session. This isn't about that. This is about opening the psychic field and setting the intention and telling my cells, I don't have to carry this anymore. And he's going to be okay if I don't. He can now be whole for whatever that means for him. And he can finally be all of himself. And I can finally have the room in my cells to be all of me if I stop carrying this for him. That's just one example, right? But it's not something that you discover alone. You know, we can try to have these little ahas as we read a book or something, but this is really about opening the field with the help of someone holding the space for you. And, and often family constellation work is done in groups because it's so powerful to have a collective focus, right? So it's really fascinating work. Um, and, you know, another quick example would be like my great grandmother had um, lost her mother at an early age and her dad um, was trying to give her away to essentially sell her to be a domestic servant in someone else's household because he could not afford 
or managed to keep a little girl. And um, she ran away to her aunt's house and was raised by her aunt. And it was this amazing story and it was held up as a success by, you know, the people in our family. It's part of our family lore that I grew up with, but she never got mothered. Mm -hmm. And she expected her daughter to mother her. And then her daughter, my grandmother, expected my mother, her daughter, to mother her. And then my mother expected her daughter to mother her. And these things get handed down. And we're doing the best we can. But until I stopped trying to be my mother's mother, I really wasn't there for myself. Right. That's such a profound but exacting story as to what it really looks like. So if somebody has like a concrete example of, oh, yes, I've seen that play out, maybe not in my family life, but somebody I know. Yeah. And, you know, it's it still gives me chills to talk about it because it was so painful and it affected so much of my life and my ability to show up for myself and was all written all through my chart. I mean, you could look at it from every freaking level, you know, biochemically, and it was there. Um, and until I address it at this level, it couldn't shift. And, um, you know, she wasn't free to be herself either, but you know, everybody's just doing their best and being really creative as they went, you know, trying to live life. It's nobody's fault. It's just how, how ready are you to be who you really are right now? And is something in your way? And if it is, let's take a look at it and let's support you through it. That's all. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. So, man, I could say, you know, you and I can sit around. <laughs> Hi, people, this is going to be a 10 hour podcast. Do we need to start another yet another podcast together? Is that what we need to do? Yeah, we probably do. <laughs> like we don't have enough to do. Yeah, we don't have enough on our plate. So it's two type A's. <laughs> We're dangerous. Yeah. We are dangerous together. We are dangerous together. So Sinclair, do you have uh, something you want to share with my listeners where they can find out more or find out more about themselves and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm the host of your health reset podcast. You're welcome to listen in. We talk about stuff like this all day long. <laughs> Uh, whether it's, you know, these little micro dose episodes that we put out about process work that you can do right now, or, you know, we have an explained series where you can learn more just bite size for 15 minutes, learn more about mold and be empowered. You know, it's not a big heavy lift. It's just something to think about. And then, um, we have a deep sleep detox free course. That's how to reclaim deep healing sleep. You're welcome to, um, pick that up on our site. We'll drop the link in the show notes, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Because if you're not sleeping deeply, it's a hell of a lot harder to heal. So let's get you resting. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why I have my beautiful grill work on because it wasn't bad enough to have braces when I was a teen. I put them back on in my late 40s, early 50s solely to get deep sleep and REM sleep, mm -hmm. you know, to re rework my airway. So there's, so there's yeah, there's nothing more profound than quality sleep. Like it's a game changer. So I agree. So that's a great course for people to check out and do. Thanks, Anne. And yeah. I know we'll do so much more together. So absolutely. Lots more to play about, but hopefully this helps um, give people some things to think about. And um, I'll just close by saying that it is never too late to feel like yourself. And I should know, cause I couldn't read an email. I couldn't write a sentence. I couldn't stand up for five minutes at a time. Like I was absolutely terrified. I've lost every function that was important to me. <laughs> and yeah. I certainly couldn't like feel emotionally like myself. You know, I was a weepy, ragey, weirdo mess. And now I do. And it's, it's a, it's a lot of chop wood, carry water. But when you take full radical responsibility for your health and you make what you believe and what you know to be important, more, um, valuable to you, than any outside dictate on your health. That's the moment when everything turns around. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You have to be your own advocate and you have to, you have to know that you're worth it too. I think that's a huge part of it also. Like take that conditioning and throw it out the door. Yeah, that is such a good point. You are so worth it. Everybody listening in, you don't need to earn the right to feel good. You don't need to earn the right to be loved or adored. You have, no matter how you've been treating yourself, the full capacity to absolutely adore the shit out of yourself and think that you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. 
Have you ever looked at how a toddler looks at him or herself in the mirror? Oh, totally. You can totally feel like that about yourself again. <laughs> They're fascinated. They adore themselves. Oh, I, yeah, I love children just like, cause they're, they're unfiltered and they're real. And then it's all our conditioning that sort of takes that away as they get older. Like, and then yeah. we get to spend a lot of money and listen to a lot of podcasts to try to get it back. <laughs> true, it's true. So yeah, it's, um, but yeah, you don't need permission to do self-care and start taking care of yourself and you don't need to earn it. Like there's no more earning it ever again. Oh, good. Take, kick that to the curb too. That's got to go. So. Love it. I love you so much. I love you too, Miss Sinclair. Thank you so much for being on this functional life. I've had fun. Me too. I'm happy to come back anytime. Let's riff. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to do it again and riff again. We'll totally do that. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening to this functional life. We'll catch you later. There we go.